Right, welcome everyone. And um, as Simon said, we'll um, talk about building a Haskell web framework. We'll keep things very simple. So for many of you who are more experienced, and I know there are a few of you, this won't be super exciting or interesting. Um, it's kind of aimed at um, beginners. Um, so you know, I hope I hope it'll help uh, those of you who are. The overarching goal is to kind of help build a mental model of what a web framework in Haskell will do, or what it should do or can do. Um, we'll build it on top of existing libraries to deal with the very low level stuff, um, but that's kind of the, uh, the goal. Prerequisites, very little I would say, Haskell syntax. Um, we're going to use monads and monads tran transformers quite a lot. How many of you are familiar with monad transformers? Okay, good. This might be this might be a bit simple for many of you, but let's see uh, how it goes. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, you know, ask if anything is unclear, uh, and then we'll we'll see how it goes. And I was hoping that at the end we could have a bit of a discussion, and you can all chip in on kind of what, how do you do web development, and what frameworks you use. So. Make sense? Right, start with a bit of background, uh, just to set the scene. What's a web server? Pretty straightforward. Takes an HTTP request, provides a, sends an HTTP response back. An HTTP request looks like this. It has a method and a path. HTTP version, which up until recently was all, almost always 1.1. Uh, list of headers and a body. The headers, uh, many of them are fully standardized, have semantic meaning and so on, but you know, we're not going to get into much detail on that. And the response looks very similar. It has the HTTP version, a status code, status um, text, but that's not very important. Again, a list of headers and a body in most cases. That's pretty much it. So what we're building on what a web server is, it really is just a program that takes a request and produces a response. And a web framework as we'll see here is something that helps the programmer do that in an efficient way. So here we have, let's see if I can get my cursor. Um, if the client sends a request, it comes into the server, which sits on a web server, which the web framework sits on top of, and you, we the programmer sort of tie into the web framework in different ways. So we're gonna focus on this part here. And frameworks can do a number of things, uh, and can be quite diverse from sort of very minimal to something that does a lot of stuff for you. Usually the least common denominator is routing, yeah. um, which helps you divide your code up by the path and the method that the request um, coming in has. Uh, then a bunch of usually has features for accessing the request and response, things like post parameters, I'll post, post for you, uh, setting headers, setting cookies, all that kind of stuff. Um, they might provide common tasks like redirection, creating redirection responses, content type setting and generation, uh, templating, security, guarding against cross-site scripting, cross-site resource, resource uh, request for forgery, SQL injection, and many or some frameworks even deal with data models and to do how to structure data uh, and through that helps you set up sessions and store information and users and so on. And famous, some famous web frameworks like Ruby on Rails and ESO uh, kind of tells you how to structure your uh, files and code as well and kind of helps you solve best practices. Mm -hmm. That's what a framework is or does, and we'll, that's what we'll look at. Makes sense so far? Nothing to do here. So let's get started. Um, by the way, we'll do something, this is going to be a bit of in between, so we'll have some slides, obviously, and we'll also do some live coding to kind of build this up, and um, so that's what we'll spend half the time on, roughly. Um, building a web server in Haskell is pretty simple, using a couple of libraries. So Haskell has a, a package called Y, uh, it stands for Web Application Interface, and it provides us with types for the HTTP request 
and the HTTP response. Uh, so it has all the information that we just saw in that plain text uh, version, uh, but in Haskell type. So it's still pretty low level, um, but it's um, parse the headers and that kind of stuff. And then it defines a type synonym called application, which is really a, a web application. It takes a request and produces a response. And this is in continuation passing style, so the this part is the continuation. Um, so if we have def to define an application, we uh, get a request and a continuation for respond, and then we call respond with our uh, response, uh, which we can produce here. This is a dummy response. Here we clearly don't look at the request, normally you look at the request here. So that defines a fully fun or a um, web application in, in Haskell. Uh, we ha haven't served it yet, so we can't really do anything with it. Uh, and that's where the next step comes in, which is warp. So why was created to create a, a, um, a kind of generic interface for web applications that you could define your web application as, and then you can use any kind of server to serve that. And warp is one of the more common choices. Um, there are also things like CGI and fast CGI handlers for Y applications. Um, Warp is used by not all but many of the Haskell web frameworks, like you saw at uh, Spark and Scott in not Snap. Uh, and the uh, Warp provides us with a function called run, which we can very easily use, uh, provide a port and then an application, and now we have a fully functioning web server. So let's So I just so basically this is stack new new, um, but because I don't have internet, uh, I can't do that. So, but we could create a basic stack, and we're going to move that to just do demo. Clear um, cool example before, and um, so have that. And the first thing we'll do is we'll need to set up some dependencies, so we are going to depend on warp, and we're going to depend on uh, y in our library, which we're going to call app, and then we're going to serve this. Signature, we get the continuation, some evidence that actually received. Uh, uh, request, respond, and we do the same thing as we saw on the slide. Uh, no headers in this case, I'm just doing hello. Alright, so this takes a lazy byte stream, uh, so we need to do add an overloaded strings extension uh, so that this sort of automatically becomes a lazy byte string and that is it for now, I think. Have I missed anything? Imports. Thank you. So we clearly need to import uh, request response and so on, and that's in network Y, and we also need that here, import uh, network Y handler, I'm not going to 
be explicitly important to this. All right, let's see. Um, <coughs> not quite. Ah, right. So, why import some types from another package called HTTP types? Things like status and headers, for example. So, we're going to need to also import that package. And then import that in the. Uh, sorry. And so the state is 200 from there, and we'll use headers, uh, types, and so on. Uh, oh. Does anyone know if I can reload packages without quitting GCI? Or do I have to quit and restart? Uh, yeah, the which packages are exposed is, for quick, is only viable by quit and rest okay. restart. Because okay. how it works is that stack computes the package set that should be exposed from the stack camel file and the cabal files and then calls GCI with the right command. Ah, okay. And that has to change, yeah. Okay. Uh, what happened here? Did it succeed? Yes. Yeah. All right. So now we should be able to run this and... Oh, yeah. Manage my windows. Sorry, I'm... So, you know, we could write our whole web application using this. We inspect the request that we got and we produce a response and that's it. The web application, or sorry, the web framework is now clearly meant to make our life easier. So we don't have to manually inspect the request all the time. So the first thing that we want to do there is routing. Um, or routing if you're an American, apparently. Um, the that basically means that we, as I said before, we take the request, we look at the method, uh, post, get, put, and so on, and the path, uh, and then we match on that, and we decide which handler should produce the response. Um, so, existing frameworks has a different uh, takes on this. It's often one of the things that distinguish frameworks. Uh, so, Yasod uh, has some fancy uh, template Haskell, and they created this DSL. Uh, so you can write kind of your router uh, in this sense, uh, in this way, uh, where this matches on, on slash and this on about and uses the home handler or about handler. So. Spock is another Haskell framework. Uh, these are not equivalent. I apologize for not doing that. Um, these are taken from the home pages of the frameworks. But here we have uh, some kind of monad and we say, well, we match on a get and the uh, path here and then we have our handler. Uh, and then they have a, some kind of uh, combinator for saying, well, I want to define this as a uh, so not, not part of the path after a slash. And then colon here means that it's a parameter which I can get and use in my handler and uh, so on. And here is snap, uh, small example. So this checks if it's the top level, so just the slash, then this is the handler, it writes a byte string to the response or you match a, try to match a bunch of routes uh, and if that doesn't work, you have an alternative here and you serve some static So basically, routing looks very different in different frameworks. Uh, it's a taste thing, people have quite strong opinions this sometimes. We're not going to go into a debate on which is better or not here. Um, we're going to do something very simple, uh, which is going to be a bit more verbose, um, but hopefully easier to think about. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the path in the request and we're going to parse that using atoparsec into a custom data type that represents the different locations in our web application. So here we have a very trivial web application and it basically says you have a home page uh, or a home resource if you're into that stuff. Uh, 
and the uh, message, which we have an integer. Um, <laughs> so, so you, any thing we have our actual parser, uh, parser um, which will basically check, you know, if it's a slash, then great, return home, otherwise parse uh, messages and a decimal and put that messages and return that. We're going to um, we'll go over this in a bit more detail when we write the code. And then the router is pretty simple. Um, the router will basically say, well, give me a method and a, a root, and um, I'll re give you a response. So here we're saying, okay, well, if it's a get and we want to go home, then use the home handler. Uh, and if it's a message, then use the message handler and pass the message ID that we parsed. So the handler is a sort of typed uh, in this case, which is quite nice. Uh, this is arguably not super nice, and there are a few ways to get around it. Um, if we didn't have this, we could get a, a warning that we didn't, we hadn't exhaustively checked everything. But the reason we do this is we usually don't actually want to exhaustively check a method. So to get around that, you would have to take the method out and just match on the uh, locations first and stuff. We won't go into the details. You can get it. Um, so that's the approach to that will take the routing. Um, it might seem like an odd approach. I'd, it might not be the ideal. It's probably not quite as bad as we might look at first, but we can discuss that later. Uh, okay. So what we'll do is we will... Uh, Route and we also want the parse route, takes a byte string. And right, so we'll do one more thing for this, and we want a either string and a route. The reason we have an either here is that's what um, after parsing parse only gives us by default, and that's why it's a string. It's easy and it's fine for us, and we won't be very concerned with that for now. But one thing we'll want to do is we're going to um, add a different prelude for convenience. So we'll just use the basic prelude. Uh, and while we're at it, we will add the route type and we will add that to parsec. And we'll go add just the later. And then we're going to say we don't want the standard prelude, so we do language no implicit prelude. You could put this in the GHC options as well. Or explicit, uh, this will define things like byte string uh, and a few other things that are convenient uh, for us. So then to parser, which we looked at, we like we did before. Um, so choice basically says try to parse, try each of the parsers in the list and use the first one that matches. Uh, is this people know what parsers are and stuff? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so we'll match on the string and we'll say just a home. And if we do that, we'll try home. Now if we did this, then this, the first thing would match and we would return home because all routes start with a slash. So we'll then need to say, actually, I want also to confirm that this is the end of the input. Uh, and this combinator says, you know, first part, uh, match this, then match this, but return this. In this case, it doesn't really matter what it returns. It'll matter in this one. Messages. And uh, if that matches, we'll want to basically this input. So now we're matching on messages and then uh, a decimal. And we want to put that in our route type. So we'll uh, just put map messages over there. And uh, just type decimal. Thank you. Great, and now we clearly also need to import after parsec. 
And this is in. Uh, eight, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and we want to export. And you're lacking a parse only on the choice then. I would expect. Uh, yes. So what I'm going to do is this. Alright. Looks okay. Right. So we can now use this um, in our application. So we'll set up a router which will uh, take a method. It will actually so it will take a standard method. Uh, this is because of the types that Y uses. It had the standard method type is the nicest to use here. It doesn't let us do any custom um, HTTP method, but it's fine for now. Uh, you could change that if you wanted to. And we'll just return an I response matter and we have a get and say home and we'll return this a bit of an explicit and we'll have a home. home. Going to be a lazy byte string, so we'll pack that from just a normal string uh, just to show something. So how do we use this? So now we need to get the uh, method and the root from the quest. So we do that by uh, saying we want the method. We want either method because maybe the method isn't one of the standard methods. So we're going to do parse method. These are parse method is from uh, y, y I think run HTTP types. And uh, we then want the request method from the request. And we want the route either, which equals um, parse route, and import. And uh, raw path info gives us the path in as a byte string, which is what we want for at a parse. So now we have those, and we do a case on these, uh, either, either, and if it's a right uh, method and a right root, then we'll do uh, something, and otherwise we'll do uh, the return not found, so good enough for now. And so we'll do not found this a response. Uh, let's make this I response. Um, and let's keep that. This is found. And now we need to uh, do not found to respond. It's there, but not found. Thank you. And here, what we do is we'll, for the router, we'll pass the method and the route to that. 
we get an IO response which we want to then pass to respond. So we can do that. Make sense? What am I missing? If anything? Export parse route. Well, let's see. Uh, uh, I need to restart. So I don't have basic prelude here. That will uh, export things like the um, append op operator. So we'll do uh, do you need that? Sorry? Do you need the more implicit prelude? I don't know, maybe I don't. I will I was so if it, you only need it if it exports under the same name as symbol that refers to a different original source location. So if you have multiple exports of the monoid yeah. or of, of a symbol like head, yeah. but it's a, it has the same definition site. But so it does. Like, oh. But this, so this will export show as a text. No. But some of the standard ones will be text instead of strings now. Okay, if that's, that's the case. Can, no, if that's the case then it's I thought, but I could it depends on how, how it's created. Seems right. So. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, and oh, we need to run it. So what should we see now? Well, we should be able to get something like so. This should now say home, and if we do messages, then this should show a message. Yay. Okay, good. Uh, and that's really the only routes we have had, so we won't do anything more. Oh yeah, we can try the new found as well. Okay, that seems good. So great. So now we have a, our router, um, which we define with uh, a parser and uh, just a normal function application. Make sense so far? Good stuff. Um, Next step is, so now we're starting to kind of write our handlers, which means that we produce our responses. Um, and there are a number of things we know we want to do in these. Right? We'll want to access the database, we'll want to log information, we'll want to uh, read headers and cookies, uh, we'll want to do query parameters, check for authorization, uh, construct URLs, and so on. Um, to do that, we need we need some information from the outside, so we need a, a handle to the database, something that you know has the connection set up to the database with the correct authorization, a logger, uh, and we'll want clearly the request, which I don't know if you noticed we missed, we, we lost here, uh, which isn't very good, um, and we'll probably want a configuration uh, file as well, uh, or a configuration type that passes things like you know do I want to automatically redirect to slash and what log level should I use? So there are kind of two ways in which we can go about this. So one way, oh, sorry. Uh, this was the previous slide, I don't know if you saw that, but it's basically what I said now. Um, one way is to be very explicit. Uh, so we have our handlers and we just pass these things uh, along as uh, explicit arguments. Uh, so if we have a, another a sub handler here, then we pass those um, requests along, uh, sorry, those values along. And in this case, it needs the request and the database handle and the log handle. Uh, here we fetch some user information, it doesn't need the request apparently, um, and so on. So that's fine, it will work, but it gets tedious and awkward. And if you want to add the, more of these or change them, then you have to change a lot of stuff all over the place. So that will get a bit annoying. Uh, the other alternative, so here is we can um, create a reader monad. So that means you know we, we build a um, some information, uh, so read on information into the monad, hide it there, uh, and if we do that, we, we call this monad here handler. Uh, we can rewrite it to look something like this. So you kind of see the the diff here is we've just made all the explicit things implicit. 
which isn't always a good thing, um, but I think in this case it's, uh, it's quite convenient and, and I think the right thing. Um, so this kind of step of saying, well, our handlers should all be in a monad is, is kind of one of the bigger steps that we'll do, and we'll then add a bunch of other functionality to this monad, which will be quite convenient as we'll see. So the next step is to create that uh, handler monad. So we'll want to add a new source file for that, call it handler, uh, so, and module handler. Uh, we don't need to expose the uh, constructors for that. Uh, we'll have a run handler as well. <coughs> so, sorry. The for now, we will just wrap a reader monad. Uh, so we'll say we have a new type. <coughs> this is our monad. And we'll say reader t. Uh, and then we'll call the environment that we put all the stuff in, env. Um, and we will say we will wrap it around IO. So this is a monad transformer uh, which adds the reader monad functionality to the inner monad, which is IO in this case, uh, and it, the reader, the thing that we can read is an environment, and A is the uh, result that we're looking at. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? Does, who doesn't know what that does? Okay, so... Uh, uh, I mean, I've seen reader monad before, but I've never mm -hmm. used it myself, so that's a little bit... Uh, so the reader monad you're not sure about, <coughs> or the transformer you're not sure about? I've just never used it for it. Yeah, so reader monad has um, kind of two... Let's see if I can do this from memory. Um, so, well, one main uh, function that you can access in the monad, which is ask, which takes uh, the reader, um, well, it's called handle in this case, so it's clearly not this, it's... it's uh, reader um, and it's going to say do uh, actually it's just going to be it's going to be something like that. The monad reader still needs to. It doesn't. Does this does have like a the a like that? Yeah, gives you the thing that's in the. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah. So it basically means at any point you can then in, in your monad say something like um, so end of ask. And now you can use the environment that you put in to begin with. Okay, so we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll use that in a minute. So, okay, that's fine. So we have our handler. Um, we'll need to import monad. Uh, reader, which provides us with the transformers as well, and to do that we need MTL the, uh, here, and we will add our handler module, and uh, well, right, run handler will take a handler of some sort. It will then take an environment because we need to put something into this monad that we can read in our uh, handlers, and then it will return a, uh, a, and this is basically just rewriting the run reader t, so we'll say we have a reader t, and uh, uh, environment, and we will then do a run reader t, reader t, environment. Like that, and I need to define the environment. We'll keep this super simple, we'll just say we have a request, uh, request, and that request is the same as the what, one from y, so we do network y, oops, there, and we will Uh, what else? I think this should be alright. Now, we want to use that here. So we'll say instead of our handlers being in I.O., the handlers will be, uh, they'll be in the handler monad. 
we don't actually have to change any of this because we're not using a single request anywhere. So this can just stay as this. But this doesn't quite work. So now this part doesn't return an actual response. So we can't just bind it to the respond function. It returns a handler model that we need to run. So we need to say run handler. Um, and this thing we need to provide an environment. Uh, so we need to do an environment and uh, this should be a request. So the request actually we could have done that. Uh, so yeah, this will actually return a response in this case, so we can still do that. And we need to make sure we export the environment. And we need to construct the environment. So actually, yeah, so we have already done that, I'll do that instead. And I'm probably missing something, but anyone? No. Let's try. And to restart with the ETL. Right. Uh, oh, right, doesn't have the basic prelude. Uh, it does. Oh, overload strings. Uh, and of course, I need to import that. So not found is also a handler, so I need to run that. And I need to derive the monad for the new. Ah, of course. Thank you. <laughs> so um, this is all very nice, but actually what we need to do is we need to derive all the monad. Uh, <coughs> the applicatives, the functures, and the uh, Moda reader functions for this because we've wrapped it in a new type, but we can use the new type deriving to do that. So we'll just say functor, applicative, monad, monad.io because we're wrapping IO, and monad reader. anything differently, which is not the most exciting code to write. Okay. okay, and now we can just test and see if it works by saying in home let's uh, get something so we'll get the request out by doing uh, and request. So asks is almost the same as ask, but basically just fmap and request ask. Um, but it asks for the nicer. So it will take the uh, environment and then we'll apply this function. So we'll get the request out. And here we can return. Um, it will show a remote host, just one of the properties of the request. And it show that. So I think that should work. Uh, And to use ask, we need to import the reader. And there we go. So now we see that we can access our request in the uh, handler. Make sense so far? All right. So next step. Um, <coughs> well, as we then start to write our handlers, um, as we start to write our handlers, we will notice that constructing responses becomes quite awkward. So for example, we have this main handler at home, and we want to set uh, the cache header on that, and say, you know, we don't want any cache here, fine. 
But then we have some subhandlers and we want to get to load the new circuit, that's okay, we don't want to do anything there. But then we want to check, okay, well, if we have a user, we want to have this other handler, we want to display a different page for them. And so we give a user ID. But this thing will set some headers. Um, so in order to then set both headers in our final response, we want to combine the headers that we get from the home user, uh, from the home handler, from the user handler, with the ha header we set here. So we kind of get them out, and then we uh, construct them again here. Uh, and it's just a bit awkward and inconvenient, and this gets worse as things grow. In this specific, specific case, we could have done something a bit different, but the general problem is still there of sort of having to manage all these things explicitly. So, what can we do about this? Any ideas? No? Yeah, so a writing mono would be a, a, a very good choice. We, well, we aren't going to do exactly that, so what's the other alternative? State, yeah. So we'll use a state mono. So a writer mono basically means you know, we can add to it. Um, so we can add a header and add a header and add a header. And that's usually fine, but in some cases we want to say actually we want to remove a header, uh, or we want to change the headers, we want to make some transformation in the headers, or at least we want to have that option. So instead of a writer mono, we'll use a state mono, but it has the same effect of um, basically hiding things in the monad, and then we can just uh, create functions to deal with it. And if we do that, then our handles can start to look a bit like this. So we can say, you know, add header, and then we have the header here, and then we don't have to really worry about uh, anything, uh, matching these, they're just done in the state monad, uh, or in this add header function. And then the home for user and public home handlers can set their headers as they want, and they're all done so the next step is to add that. So now we have all our hand, most of our handler stuff set up. So we, this is fairly simple. We need a state. What is the state? We'll call it meta. Um, and we'll have a meta headers, which is header, list of headers. Um, this, so headers in uh, HTTP responses, you can have headers occur more than once. So you can't just have a straight map. So you could have a map to a list, which can be convenient in some cases. We're not going to worry about actually doing much with these headers, so we'll just use a, a list. Um, and then we'll, we're also going to put the status in here. It's not quite as obvious, but it's, it means that we can worry about only returning the body in our handlers, and the state can be, can be managed separately. So it's status. Um, um, but we don't have to set it. So we're gonna do that. And then we're gonna add. So we're gonna then transform this, add a state as a state transformer monad. Um, and it means we also want the monad state functions, right? Uh, and we need the state monad state. Uh, and let's add two simple functions. We want to just add a header, it takes the header and uh, Unit, add header, header, and this will, will use the modify, which is from the state, uh, state monitor function. We'll get a meta, so this is when we can want lenses, and that will not, we'll do it without. Headers uh, equals meta, headers meta, and uh, Something like that, and set so yeah, and set status. It's a bit simpler. Modify just status, just status. Right. Go and these we want to expose. So these are kind of part of our framework if you want. Um, and you can imagine we want many other ones like remove header and modify header and all that kind of stuff. But we'll just keep to these simple ones now. And I don't know if I'm something. And then let's try and use these. Oh, of course. So now we've changed the handle. 
um, monad. So the run handler clearly won't work. This is no longer a reader uh, transformer, this is a state transformer. So we'll need to change this. And um, we'll change one more thing though. So, so far the run handler has been generic, so we've been able to run a handler of any types. We're now going to specialize it to, for our purposes. So we're going to say, well actually, we're only going to be able to run handlers that return a body. In this case, we're just going to accept lazy byte stream bodies. Later we can do more stuff with that, uh, we can accept different kinds of bodies, but for now, it's just going to be lazy byte string. Um, and then, we're always going to return a response. And the reason for that is, we now already have the uh, headers and the stages, so with the body and the headers and the stages from the state, we can construct a response and that ends up being quite convenient to use in our application. Does that make sense? Right, so we'll need this answer. Right, uh, and then this needs to change, so we'll do liberty, we'll stay, run state t, state t, and we'll need initial state, and um, we won't give the client of one handler any choice in that, we'll just give them an empty one, which was just going to be this. So no headers and no stages set. <coughs> now, run reader will still work, but it will return something different. So the, the state monad will, the data type for that basically consists of the value, and a tuple of the value and the state. So what we'll get out here is the body, this lazy byte string here, and a uh, state, which is our meta information. Uh, and this will be an IO, so we will get it out from IO here. And then we want to construct a response from this. So we want some headers. Headers. And they are, uh, we get them from the meta, and this is quite easy, because they're always there, it can be an empty list. And we want some status, and we're saying, well, that could be a maybe though. So we'll say maybe we'll just default to success, um, and then we will do meta status meta. And now we can just return our response, which is a lazy byte string with the status, the headers, and the body. And that's good. And our application now. Now run handler uh, actually works. So this doesn't, the run handler itself doesn't change. We've used it with that uh, before. We actually used it to give an environment and, and a handler uh, and it re returns a response. The thing that does change though is that the handlers don't return a full response. They now only return this body, the lazy byte string looked at. So we need to change that and of course in a real framework, you would specialize this in body type, or you would put that in the state as well, which we'll discuss later. Uh, you import it under L8. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Ah, you're going to Can I use the same thing? <coughs> I was going to do that. Uh, I'm not sure if it makes a big difference. The same, same type. type. Then we'll do that. Um, so L the car just exports more combinators, or? And the different uh, it's it's like this. So there's the lazy byte string type. That's the underlying representation. Yeah. And then lazy char eight is a re-export of these functions. Sometimes on the different type signatures, mm -hmm. it makes okay. this assumption that every byte is interpreted as mm -hmm. a code point in the range from zero to to the power of eight. Okay. Um, but yeah, in, in that case, I, I will probably import it in both. Okay. Using your import, yeah. just to make clear that actually here you just want to return actual objects. It's, yeah, because the body could be some encoded version. I don't know. Does anybody know uh, that there are proper new types around lazy char eight, or uh, as in particular an ASCII string? Because that's essentially what you wanted to use, I think. Sorry, where? Like your L eight pack? Yeah. Well, to me that sounds more like uh, please pack encode this as an ASCII string. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. 
But then, actually, this would be about the time where you would switch from Lazy Char 8 to uh, Byte String Builder. Okay. And I just run Builder because there you can probably say encode this string as you did with 8. And yeah. Then I would also, yeah, if we did that, we would want to change this as well. So then there's a response type in Y that actually uses Builder rather than Byte String. Uh, so I won't do yeah. that now. Um, but that's fine. Um, so, for well, simplicity, sorry, no, no, sorry, fine. Fine. no, no, no. We just, for simplicity, we just keep into lazy byte strings. There are you can use streaming and stuff, and uh, some of the builders and so on as well. Um, but that's a sort of uh, another talk. So we'll let's see what we have. We have our handles now. Just returning the body. Well, type signature says they're just returning the bodies. They clearly aren't. So we need to change that. Um, so status 200, let's set that explicitly, so we can use the set status thing that we defined. And we just return the uh, byte string, and here we'll do the same thing. We can't be bothered to set the thing here, it'll work anyway. And return that, but, okay, fine, and then not found here. So not found, let's try the header. Function. Let's add a content type header. So we'll say what we want this to be text HTML maybe, um, and then what we'll return will return a HTML a non um, not very nice version of the HTML here, but the browsers are lenient, so it'll be fine. Something like that, and we also want to set the status here because this is actually not the default status 404. All right, uh, all right, let's try this out. I'll do something else. And the system is too good in this, is it? Yeah, I just the message, and I was just close to the header. Uh, now there comes in no implicit predicate. Oh. HTTP types, maybe? Yeah, exactly. So here we've now used the headers, so we need to import HTTP types. What else was missing? No implicit predicate. Ah, this is nice. Yeah. <laughs> Which one? This one? Yeah. Cool. And now let's see if this works. So this should be the same thing, but if we do it, this should now return some HTML. Beautiful. Um, we'll have a look. And what do we, can we see? So the status code is 404, so that seems to work, and the content type is text HTML. So it now seems that we can set headers and we can uh, set status code. That's good. Um, all right. Kind of just one more, sort of one feature uh, missing. Or, well, there are lots of things missing, but one structurally important thing. So now we're writing even more handlers, and we realize that for some of these handlers, we want to do uh, authorization, and we want to get objects, and so on. So we have this restricted handler page that where you can look at messages that you own. Uh, so you go to some URL, we parse that using the message and we get some message ID out. Uh, and then we pass it to this restricted handler. Uh, so first we have a handler that will try to fetch that message from the database. Uh, this will look at the reader that we just constructed, we will have a, a database handle in there, it will look up the database. But because this was a URL, you know, who knows if this exists, so this can fail. So we get a maybe message, uh, and then we check if it's, there is no message, then we want to return not found, you know, that URL doesn't exist. It's good. If there is a message, great, you know, then we continue to the next step, and we check, well, is there a user? You need to be a user to have the authorization to do this, okay? Well, we get a lot of user, that might exist. If that doesn't exist, we return not found. You could return not authorized or redirect to the signing page or something like that. So it's pretty simple. But there is a user um, uh, here, and then we say, okay, well, is the user the owner? 
Okay, well, so we check that here. And if it is, great. Now we finally render the message and we uh, return. Otherwise, we save our file. Right. <laughs> so that's not very nice. Like, we don't want this you know, staggering of things and it gets messy when it gets complicated and so on. So, you know, what can we do? Um, we kind of want to say, you know, give me what I want uh, or, you know, don't bother coming back. Like, I'm not interested in, in if you fail, I, I have nothing to do here. So there's a monad for that. Uh, it's called the accept monad. Nowadays, it used to be called error, um, which will allow us to do exactly that. It kind of, so in, as an example, we can then write a require message, and uh, message ID, which basically says, well, I promise to give you a message, and if I don't, then I'm just going to shortcut all this rest of stuff. And we're not going to do that, and I'm going to fail. And we're going to need to deal with that failure when we run the monad, but the, the monad is basically defined, if you sort of remember the bind definitions, it's an either type, so it can be a left error or exception, or a right correct value. Mm -hmm. So in the bind, if it's a left, then the, it completely ignores the right side of the bind and will just properly the left. So if the require message here returns an exception, a left, then the monad will basically say, okay, don't do anything, ignore, 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 and then when we finally run the monad, we will need to figure out what, what to do with that. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So then we can do this, which is <coughs> significantly nicer. We can say, well, require a message, require a user, and we know we have a user, uh, and we can write this other sort of handler helper function, if you want, that just takes a boolean, uh, and when this boolean is uh, true, then just bail out and say no. So this is kind of our authorization block guard, if you want. And, so. and if that all passes through, then we're just going to render the message. So that is significantly nicer than this, I think. All right? OK. So let's implement that. Uh, now, there is one thing to note when you wrap up these um, Monad transformers, so the outer transformer will wrap the value of the inner transformer with whatever thing it does. So in this case, it uses an either. So it wraps the value of the inner monad with an either. So in this case, if we put the accept handler around here on the outer block and we wrap the whole thing, the value of the statement is actually the body. The meta is the state which is sort of not the value of the monad, so it's not the A in this case. So we would actually get an either here, so yeah. body either if you want. Uh, and while that would work and be okay, we don't really want that, we kind of want the either on the other side because if we fail we're not interested in the headers and the status that was set because we failed so who knows if that's valid or not. So to get that uh, we actually want the state, uh, we want to do it inside the state. Set T, and the, we're going to call this bail, inner monad, and I think we need that. Okay, it's a bail, and we're going to have two ways of bailing. So now, you know, in our framework, we can come up with a bunch of different kinds of failures. We could, you know, bail for authorization failure, bail because something wasn't found, we're just going to do two examples. It's very simple, and we're going to do a bail redirect. Uh, we're just going to take a byte string as the URL location in this case. And we're going to need a... So now we get to the fun historic part. So, Mona, the accept monad used to be called the error monad, and you'll still find this in the Haskell documentation. The, sort of, the nomenclature is should be, I think, or at least I think it makes sense and what I heard it, that exceptions are things that are bad but are expected to happen. So if you write to disk and disk is full, that's an exception. If you try to, in your code, multiply two strings and think you get a number, like that's an error, that's a programming error. So errors are things that programmers need to fix, exceptions are stuff that happens kind of, that we should be able to expect. So that's, I think, the at least that's one of the, the ways of defining the, the different terms. 
And not everyone uses these, so you can take a pinch of salt. But I think uh, we're kind of moving towards that. But this bone and error type class is uh, still using the old one, so we use more and error, but it's exported by um, the except type class. So we should be, can ignore it for the most part. Does that make sense? You don't have any objections? Yeah. All right. So, right, so that's kind of good, um, but we now need to deal with these failures, right? So instead of getting the, uh, so on the state, instead of getting a reader, we actually get an accept t, and from that, reader t, we get, uh, we run the accept transformer, accept t. Now we don't need any uh, arguments to that. But then what do we get out here? So we don't get this body me uh, meta anymore. We get some kind of result um, either. Kind of uh, run reader t reader t m. And then we need to case match on that. We need to match it up. So if this is right, then great. We basically get this stuff here and we can do what we did pretty much so we succeeded nothing is different from before we'll, we'll just do what we did there fantastic but if we fail then we fail in, we can fail in two ways so we can fail in not found in that case what we want to do well we still need to return a response that's what we promised that so what response do we return we return a um, for for not found. And clearly we can do something nicer there. Uh, or we will fail with a redirect, um, which is a URL, and what we have there, we will do something similar. Uh, so what's the temporary redirect? No one? Um, so we we have a location and that gives the URL. Uh, we don't need any body for that. So now what to do we you haven't yet imported byte string for the bell redirect. Don't know whether you want it strict or lazy. Uh, for the bell so line twenty two. Ah uh, yeah no, so that's in the basic prelude. Oh it is strict. Oh yeah, okay. Um, okay, so uh, again, probably missed something, um, but can't read that perspective. But let's see. So uh, right. So how do we actually fail? How do we throw errors? So there is. Um, let's add a redirect function just for for fun. Uh, we can see we can do that here. So redirect. What would that do? It would kind of take a byte string again. You clearly probably want to specialize these into some new types to do with because we know that this is a URL. Um, but we won't do that now. And then we'll say redirect, take the URL, and we want to throw an error. And again, the nomenclature here is a bit iffy. But we we'll throw an error. What error do we throw? We throw bail, we direct. And this throw error is from the uh, is the exception on that uh, import URL. All right, and then uh, let's <coughs> export that as well so you can use it. All right, fantastic. And we have the handler, we've imported that. So let's say, uh, okay, let's do something silly. Let's say if i equals three, then uh, we're going to redirect to uh, home. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Good point. Uh, yeah. Which should also be in the basic value, I think, right? I think so. Um, so when takes a boolean and then something and um, 
That's that. What else? That's right. Okay, I'll go. Yeah. Oh, wow. Let's see. Um, so now what do we, what do we expect to happen? Uh, so we expect most things to work as before, right? Um, messages 2 should be fine. But maybe if we do this, it should redirect to home. Yes. So now we say, okay, if we go to 3, then we get a temporary redirect. And we don't, we don't get the any body or anything back. So we now, we can fail, and we can do this for not found as well, and so on, but I won't uh, bore you with, with adding that. And that's it. So. Let's see. I might have lost my presentation. That's pretty much it. Like we now have a kind of web framework-ish, if you squint a bit. But we have the. There clearly it's not very polished, and there is a lot of features you want to add to this. But the basic structure is there. Um, you know, we have some routing that actually works. Um, environment access. DB handles and logs and uh, configuration and so on, press of course. Response manipulation, setting headers, which we can expand to on with set cookie functions and so on. And app level exception mm -hmm. handling. Uh, next steps, if we wanted to do it, we're not going to do that now, we're basically going to stop here. Uh, we could do permanent uh, redirects, temporary redirects, we just did a temporary redirect. We remove headers, set headers, cookies, you know, all these kind of convenience functions that you kind of want from a work framework. Uh, I'm hoping that it should be relatively sort of obvious how to implement those, uh, given what we just looked at. The DB and logger handles, or whatever else you want, would go into the environment, which we now just have the request, so we'd expand that. Uh, link generation is basically just adding printer printer to the uh, root type, which is you know, pretty much trivial. Um, there is a, we'll discuss that in a, in a little bit. Um, you can then do automatic redirection to kind of the URLs, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, you basically say, well, I parse this root. If I pretty print that root, is it the same as the original one in the request? And if not, then redirect to the pretty printed one. Uh, so you get that automatic. Um, you can do stuff to say, you know, HTTP, in an HTTP request can say, you know, I want a JSON or I want an HTML or I want an XML. So you can sort of do some content type request negotiation. We can add some functionality to do that if in our handlers, instead of returning this byte string that we always did here, we can construct a body type that has sort of values, maybe values for HTML and JSON or other things. A few other ways of doing it as well, but that's one way. And then in our run handler, we basically check well, what was the accept header in the request and what, hand, what sort of body handlers are available. Or body um, types are available, representations are available, and then do the logic of figuring out, okay, well, the uh, client prefers the HTML, and we have an HTML, so we're going to give that, or the JSON one. So that could be automated. You might want to actually add the body to the uh, state, where we have the headers and the status as well. But that could make the uh, sort of code a bit neater, potentially. It's a bit of a sort of, uh, valid uh, taste thing and if you always return the body you have some type checks that you can force people to return a body and if they don't do that they might not be doing what they want and so on. Uh, but that's a different discussion, it's a design discussion. Uh, you probably want to do something with form handling and CSRF protection. For that you probably need access to a database and you need to figure out how to link that in. Uh, and then you clearly want to have some configuration options which again is just adding something to the reader. And then you can continue and you can say, you know, we want to do some data types and all sorts of stuff. But the, the general structure is kind of there and for a, a basic kind of Scotty-like sort of simple or Sinatra or Express or whatever you're, you're used to kind of framework, this kind of is enough. Uh, not, you need more helper functions and stuff, but this kind of would do it. So you see, hopefully you, know, you can see kind of what the, the structure is. Does that kind of make sense, or uh, any, any questions? Or?
This comes back to, um, I don't know how the fast CGI and so on works in detail, uh, but in most um, you know, Amazon or Linode or whatever you want, you get your own server and you can do whatever you want on there. Uh, if you have basically like a folder where you need to put some stuff, I'm not sure exactly what the rules there are. That'll be different from uh, provider to provider. But if you get like a normal server, then yeah. That's still done these days. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah. But at least ten years for me since I last saw. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, this will produce an executable. Uh, so you, know, you can compile it on any Linux server, and you can compile it in Windows, I think, as well. Uh, I don't know how good the JC Windows compiler is. It works. Yeah. Good. It works. Uh, Niklas, you mentioned last time that you run. Uh, use stack docker support to run essentially such applications on top of Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think that would be, this venue would also be very easy to use stack docker and then run it on Google Cloud? Yeah, I think you can probably do that, yeah. So, I mean, with stack has this functionality where you can just take your entire application and pack it in a docker container and then you can, if you don't want to, let's say, care about renting servers at all or so, then you can take one of the cloud providers, mm -hmm. so for example the Amazon container service or, or Google's container service or what, and you give it just that Docker container and you run it. Oh, that's also possible. That, to me that sounds like the internet provider of yeah. this, year, this yeah. century. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a few, one trick I, I noticed is um, that it's, it's a very small trick, just naming, but yeah. it's one of the hard things. Yeah. Um, Too hard. You, you use the trick that if you have something that isn't either, you say result either. Yeah. One thing I have to found to work well is that you say uh, it's error or result or exception or uh, result. Okay. Yeah. So just yeah, name the two things. More explicit and nice. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and it, it works quite uniformly. It's a bit longer. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, in, in the same way, instead of suffixing the maybe as may, yeah. if you do a mb, small, lowercase, uh, in front, then that's, that's pretty similar, it's just... Okay. Yeah. 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 That's nice. I think the, the reason I started using may was there is a... Is it safe, safe that does it? Mm -hmm. So the safe prelude used that, so I just assumed it was kind of... They standard. use it for the functions. But, yeah. Like head may. Yeah. They but don't not have for any values of type maybe, so... Yeah. But yeah, I mean, no, 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 naming conventions are just things that yeah, 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 we develop. These two um, good fun to work. Thank you. And the other thing that I notice is if I compare... So, first of all, really nice presentation, I like it a lot. Um, and it's, it's funny to compare that to the times when we at Better wrote our web application. <laughs> one of the refactorings. Mm -hmm. So one of the refactorings that we did is that we switched from sort of this stateful generation of responses where at some point in the code, oh, set had a cache control, yeah. uh, to a more declarative uh, generation of responses where you have an explicit response type, sort of a, a, a semantic description of what kind of response you can do. Oh, this is cacheable. It might be that you have, in some cases, a combinator language where you make a response cacheable, and then you have a little interpreter that takes these responses and translates that into, oh, you need to set this header, you need to do that. Yeah, is that something that you considered or not for this? Like, I think that's very sensible, and I think the um, it depends a lot on what you want and what the kind of framework should be for. I think for it, that you kind of need to make specific to the application. I think you need to, or yeah, probably the statement I'm like, making is that this thought framework, yeah. where you say, okay, the first thing I do is I parse to my custom. Uh, request type, yeah. 
and then I just have a handler that translates in I/O from this request type to response type. Mm -hmm. And these two things are actually very nicely independent of HTTP. Mm -hmm. Because I just expose them over thrift or whatever, yeah. um, keeping the same logic. And that, that's why I actually would say this should be the thought, thought framework you do, and HTTP is just a mechanism to deliver that data. Yeah. What I also recognized is that you suggested to have multiple response types if you want to support, um, what is it, content type negotiation? Yeah, different representations. What about just making the requested content type part, you extract that as part of, uh, of your request parsing, just say, well, this is a request for this thingy in that format. Yeah, you could. Um, I mean, that's sort of, either you, th this would be more, and you hide that logic, so yeah, it, it's, it's clearly isomorphic, right? You can say either I just want to say in my handler that I have all these, I know how to produce all these representations, you know, now you someone else can figure out kind of what should happen, and if you want to write a framework, then you know that can provide that, but of course, you can also bring that function out and make an explicit thing that you have to call in your request type and say, well, tell me what is the most preferred, um, or, you know, or I guess you say, I can give the most preferred, but you want that. So you want to say, here are the different things I can produce. Tell me which one to produce. And then you do a case match in that, right? So yeah, the problem is like, there is a bit of logic involved. So it means it's, you have two lists, one of like, here are the representations I want the client. And you have another list, which is here are the representations I can produce as the handler, and you kind of want to find the best match of those. Um, so I mean, you can I, do I understand. I think the the difference between the two approaches shows when you actually have to do database access yeah. um, in order to generate different responses and different kinds of database access. Right. So then you so I assume you yeah. say. Actually, yeah, please tell me up front. Yeah, yeah. I have this logic. If you want to share that logic, you package that into a separate function. But it seems really to be something that is input data, not output data. I think that's a very good thing. Right? I assume here that the representations really are just representations. So the data you need is the same, the authorization rules are the same, everything is the same, except do I want to render this as HTML or JSON or XML? Right? And that's kind of semantically that's kind of what you should do, but of course there are sure that cases when that okay. isn't the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, but no, like the whole thing about you know, this is kind of like the whole routing thing and pattern matching kind of restful -y approach and uh, that may or may not be, be what you want, uh, in which case you know, many of these things can go away, but hopefully the Billion now with exception handling and so on can be quite convenient in other cases, so maybe that's that's it. Uh, that's it. Like, if people have any questions about like what frameworks, you can ask the room. Uh, like, if you, I don't know what people are using for Haskell web frameworks nowadays. Oh. Just one thing yeah. regarding IO in in your like you from the very beginning you make this handler uh, wrapper around IO. Yeah. And also in, in most frameworks, I think this is the same. But does it make sense to some extent try to put away I.O. and try to put as much as possible uh, pure stuff? And like where this like boundary lies between yeah. where we need to get rid, where so we can get rid of I.O. and where we have to use it in this case? Good question. Uh, so my view, we can see what the rest of you think. Uh, my view would be that for the actual handler monad, like this, kind of top level, it makes sense to have access to I.O. because you want to have database access and so on. But you should make the handlers as lean as possible. So the logic that handlers use should call out to pure functions you know, that you can test. So you know, only the stuff that you know, really need I.O., you compose that in the handler, uh, and then you pass it to pure functions and get the back end. So the handler should be fairly light. That would be my view. So I probably wouldn't remove I.O. from the handler in, in if you use this kind of structure. But yes, absolutely push as much to I also don't know, like Simon Leonard or Thomas or Jussi or... Well, I think uh, Jasper gave a talk a while ago where he talked about the uh, this interpreter pattern where there's a surprisingly number, and I think it was good Haskell, Haskell style, I'd say, uh, or Indians, I 
forgot. Anyway, uh, the idea is, so the thing is, if you put I.O. in it, that will... Uh, the idea is basically to build your app from... Uh, it's also in Java that everywhere, the clean architecture. You build your entities in the middle, your business logic around it, and your framework is all the way on the outside. Okay. Uh, so in this case, it makes sense that the handler, at some point you have to do I.O. But then, um, for example, you, you, in your example, you mentioned does the user exist? Do some lookup, lookup, mm -hmm. and all that was in the handler mode, yeah. which is automatically an I.O. Now, what if you wanted to simulate whether, like, have all your handlers and simulate various kind of access patterns uh, and then if you have this handler on it you may have to mock a lot of the uh, kind of uh, physical domain like the HTTP protocol or something but if you do it as a DSL basically and you can use you, uh, Jasper showed how you can do that with database access basically the, you have a, a monad with a free monad basically which says uh, now I actually need some data from the outside, and then the interpreter provides that data, and then mm -hmm. the handler can continue to run. That's the interpreter okay. model. And using that, you basically have an interpreter which speaks the languages that your requests need to speak, and then the framework would just run it with I.O. in a real database. But for your tests, you could actually generate lots of interactions in that framework, and then maybe have some constraints on what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So you basically you build a, yeah you build your domain logic as a as a language and then you have an interpreter. It's basically the same model where you say uh, this is just the HTTP thrift is just the outside world and you translate it with your do, in, into your domain. Okay. And you could encode that into some kind of framework. But I think it's difficult to make that as framework. It's more of a, an idiom or pattern. Yeah, I think that's also like <coughs> very much approach in, in React Banana Library, where we have two type two example like two instances of almost the same one. One is wraps around IO and another one is pure. And that's why I wonder if maybe some, some framework also do the same, where it, if you see that you don't actually need at this moment access to database to something like when you have your actions, when you have when you use pure monad, and then you can just lift it into into IO version, and that's why I thought maybe something similar could be done also here. Yeah, I mean you could write the handle without IO if you didn't need access. I think in many cases what you'll see is that just I mean here we also have pure code where you just see return and then this computation. So I'm. Um, as soon as your logic becomes more complicated, like how exactly you render this flight selection page or whatever, then if you structure code such that you first fetch data, and then just the pure result of the data, and then you have a pure rendering function, then a lot of your, your code is going to be pure by construction. And it doesn't really hurt that your handler is in there. What is important is that you're conscious about it, and you don't just do everything in this handler mode. So if the handler mode is the I.O. with a bit more, but you don't as you can go away from I.O., you can also move away from the handler on it. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank uh, you. It should have been a bit more explicit in the description as a sort of beginner's level talk. Uh, I apologize. That it's a bit too simple for some. I have some appendix for doing the link automatic uh, canonical URLs and